Viewer discretion is advised. People won't try and go to the next level because they've been taught to be grateful for where they are. They'll be like, okay, I'm lucky to have a job, so I'm not going to go for team leader. And then I came back, okay, sweet, I'm not going to be quiet anymore. And it changed my life. Mandate. Welcome to Mandate, where we navigate fresh perspectives and nothing is off the table. Tonight's guest is from Tamaki Makuru Okilani, but originally from the Hawke's Bay area. And so the man is an electrician by trade. The man has traveled uh, up across the Motu, but also extensively overseas. But the man is very passionate about writing. And so he's done freelance writing for several publications, uh, but also had a, a regular column on the on Mana magazine. And so the man is um, not only passionate about writing, but also to date, he's renowned for his uh, his journal, his daily bilingual journal, gratitude journal, known as Whakawhitae. And so this is the journal right here. Please, please, uh, have a have a look and also um, please um, plug in real quickly uh, buy this amazing journal a uh, gratitude journal so the man has also has an amazing story to share so please put your hands together for the man himself Hina Nathan yeah, thank you thank you I was wondering how you were going to do that but I was like that was the bit I was waiting for thank you <laughs> Oh, brother, thank you so much for coming in um, tonight, um, Hira. It's a real privilege. Everyone that comes on, I'll guess they come in. It's a, it's a real honour and a privilege. But, brother, it's just to start the ball rolling because fuck uh, fitai, the gratitude. Tell us, what, what was the whole backdrop or the story? Obviously, you've shared with other people, but if you can share your own words, what, what, what why, why this journal, why this bilingual journal, but also uh, the heart behind this yeah, yeah. Ah, tua tahi. Um, ko wai o ko hira Nathan tō ku ingoa. E uri tēnei o Ngāti Kahungunu, Ngāpuhi, uh, Ngāti Tūwhare Toa Hoki. Uh, e noho ana au ke uh, ki, ki ko nei, engari i tupu ai o ki uh, hira taunga. My name's Hira. Um, mai iwi uh, Ngāpuhi up north, Ngāti Tūwhare Toa in the Bay of Pliny, and Ngāti Kahungunu down in the east coast. Um, yeah, the journal, I... Um, so yeah, originally I did one, I did a gratitude journal, and then I finished that, and then um, I went to buy another one, and it was $50 US, and I thought, oh, well, I, I don't want to pay that. I was like, So then I thought, okay, how do I make my own? And then I thought, okay, and how do I make it so that everyone can have one? You know, not just people that have got 70 bucks to spend on a journal. And then, so, and then I thought, oh, how can I make it so that it appeals to to not only Māori and Pacifica, but all, all New Zealanders. And so I incorporated some Māori tanga in there. And then, yeah, it kind of just went from there. And, like, I made something that I loved and that was incorporated my Māori tanga and that I thought Kiwis would love. And, yeah, that was priced so that everyone could, could do it, not just people that had heaps of money. Cool, man. Obviously, you're, you're passionate about writing, um... Um, Peter, and so that passion about writing is it, has it always been something that you've kind of grown with, or something that's been embedded in you, or just just in your spare time you just kind of write and and journaling and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, yeah, I guess I always liked writing. It was the only thing I was kind of good at, you know. <laughs> I was like, I, I I was never, I wasn't shit at anything. I was always average at stuff, you know. I was an all right footy player and. I used to skateboard at school and stuff, and I was all right at that. And, like, you know, I was okay at school. I'd get just enough to pass. But I was pretty good at writing, so I liked it. And, you know, and the teachers, would, the English teacher told me that I was good at writing. Well, one of my, no, it wasn't the English teacher, actually. It was, like, Mrs. Jones. She was, like, the disciplinary lady, and everyone hated her. Like, like everyone was like, oh, she's a bitch, you know, like. <laughs> but she was real nice to me. I don't know why, but she was real nice to me, and she, t she always told me, that I was good at writing and like, you know, I used to join in with the boys and pretend that I hated her, but really, I really liked her because she was nice to me. But And so it was probably from then, it was probably her telling me that I was good at it, that I sort of liked and enjoyed writing. And then, yeah, and I went to university. I, I, dropped, I went to school. Oh, after I finished school, I took off to America for a little bit and the UK and then I came back and I went to university and um, I did Māori and English, and then the plan was to do journalism, but then I dropped out to do an electrical apprenticeship. And, um, yeah, I kind of just stayed doing that, and the writing 
kind of just took a back door, really. What was it about when you were um, doing journalism that you thought, oh, nah, just not me, I'll change it, and go into... Um, um, Come on, Sparky. Sparky. Oh, the, Nothing really. I just got too caught up in the university life, man. Oh, like, yeah. like, oh, it's like it's like tell us the truth. Tell us the truth, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was down. Yeah, I was down in Otago, and yeah, I just got too caught up in that life, and 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 partied heaps, yeah, and the scuffies. Eh? Yeah, with the scuffies, and loved it. And then so I was like, oh, okay, this is bad for me. I need to do something else after, you know, three years of going to parties. I was like, oh. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not getting anywhere so I, like, I did electrical apprenticeship oh cool oh, and so eventually would you go back to trying to oh no because you're already writing you don't need it anymore yeah yeah so I um, yeah I didn't do any writing and then one day I was just like oh you know I, I want to write and so I did cool. I just started writing like so then I, I started writing articles for the newspaper and like, and that started because I was doing kickboxing at the time. And um, so I started covering like fight shows and stuff. And I figured out that if I could get like the pro, I go to the promoters and say to the promoters, oh, if I write this article and it gets in the Waikato Times and it gets on stuff, will you give me one of those corporate tables for free? <laughs> and then they did. And then so I kept doing it. And then. Like, I was like, oh, yeah, I, I like this. And then, so, yeah, then I just kept writing, really. Wow. Well, obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a talent. That's a, it's a, it's a real talent, bro. Um, for, you know, not anyone can just get up and just kind of write and, and um, get into, have a regular column like the, uh, in, in Mana Magazine and, and also several publications. And so, obviously, you're, you're really good at it. And so, so, the transition to becoming a sparky electrician, what made you kind of like, okay, now I need to go back to, to writing? Uh, I guess, no, I think it was always there, like, I, I I did a few, like, short stories, and, um, like, and, yeah, I, I think I just always enjoyed it, and always liked writing, I just used to write for myself, and I always wanted, I write, wanted to write a book, um, yeah, it didn't, it kind of just didn't leave, but just had a rest, I guess, yeah. and then I was like, okay, sweet, it's time, and then... Yeah, I was lucky enough that, that I was able to get into the newspapers and then I reached out to Mana and then I wrote for a couple of gig guides in Hamilton and, yeah, did a few things and, yeah. Wow, oh, man, that's awesome. <laughs> and I, I've always been interested because I know that just because someone writes it doesn't necessarily mean they like to read. Is reading something you're passionate about then that you do a lot of or is it you actually just like writing itself? Uh I probably like writing more than I like reading, but yeah, I do read. Um, I, I, yeah, I, my girlfriend loves reading, so I kind of just like she'll read and then she'll find me a book that I like, and yeah. So I guess I, well, when I was younger, I never read anything. I didn't read a whole book until I was about thirty. Like, and then yeah, but my girlfriend reads like a book a, a book a month, and so then I've picked up the reading habit, and it's cool. Man, that's cool. And out of curiosity, what made you go towards being um, an electrician? Like you could have done a hundred different things, but was there something particular about that um, that drew you to being a sparky or was it just more opportunity and timing? No, oh, my dad was a tradie. Like, yeah, so he was a plumber and so it was kind of just like I was always going to be a tradie, I guess. I grew up around tradesmen and like, and then, yeah. Uh, I just picked electrical because I didn't want to unblock toilets and stuff. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's cool. Did your dad give you crap when he found out you you were a tradie but not not a plumber? No, nah, no. Nah. Oh, my dad died like qu quite a few years ago when I was in my twenties, oh. and so I didn't get registered until after he died. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Man. So what is it about gratitude? Because um, so, I know um, you've spoken about it before. And like when we think about giving gratitude, it's like, oh yeah, give thanks. But um, 
the word gratitude must mean so much more to you. Uh, what uh, does it mean to you? I think, like, for me, so when I did the first journal that I got given, um, I didn't, like, I didn't really believe in it. I was like, oh, whatever, I'll give it a go, you know. And then, like, after a couple of days, I was hooked, you know. I started, like, just looking at the world differently, you know, like, like instead of, you know, driving along and being gutted about the long day I've just had at work or whatever, I'll be like, oh, yes, sweet. I can't wait to get home and I'm going to have a nice feed. I'm going to see my dog. I'm going to see my girlfriend or whatever. And like, yeah, and then I just started seeing more of the positive things rather than like all of the neg negative things that were going on. And so, yeah, I was hooked straight away. And then that kind of just like, like, um, just trans, like, um, that attitude kind of, carried on into the, all the other aspects of my life. Like, um, like oh, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, or like when my girlfriend, like, like, you know, you know, sometimes you have, you get up in the morning and then my girlfriend's like, oh, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? Can you do this? I'm like, can I get all her? And I'm like, oh, but I do it anyway. And then like, you know, I'll take off to work. And then in my mind, I'll be like, oh, that's silly, you know? So the, all of those things that annoyed me before, all of a sudden I'd realise that they were just really insignificant and a waste of time. Like, like I'd spend half an hour being annoyed about it and it only took me 10 minutes to do the job. <laughs> so I spent more longer being annoyed about it, you know what I mean? And so the practice of gratitude taught me that, like, a lot of the problems that I had were just in my own head and they weren't really problems. And so, like, yeah, and gratitude just like sort of transferred into the rest of my life, really. Mm. Bro, me, me. <coughs> Do you feel before you started practicing um, the, this discipline or, or this um, type of um, devotion, like were you a negative person before or like what type, were you just like wasting energy on being negative or you just didn't see things like that? No, I wouldn't say okay. I was negative, but you know, I was just, just normal. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. think people are, I think, like, and I listened to this podcast the other day and they were talking about like how, how humans, how we, we're, we're naturally programmed to see negative things. Mm -hmm. And it's like a survival instinct from back in the days, but, but now we don't have to worry about, you know, lions and tigers and stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. those, those sorts of dangers don't exist anymore. So we don't need that same level of, of cautiousness mm. and so now we don't need that that cautiousness but we still are programmed to see that negative thing as a survival instinct and so if you can sort of knock that back a little bit and see those same negative things in a positive light then you just naturally be a bit more happy mm. yeah I'm really good it's just so good um Peter because I think your, your book is timely I think it's real timely in terms of gratitude and being th and grateful and being thankful for um, a lot of things in, in life. Uh, I think a lot of people can be quite pessimistic and quite negative and like you're saying, a kind of survival um, mechanism or survival instincts. Um, but in terms of um, the gratitude and whakawhetai, I love the fact that you kind of put in te reo. And so was it always something that you were thinking of, of writing, um, putting in the bilingual or was it something that, oh man, it'd be cool just to, just to, just by chance? No, so at the time, so I, 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 I went to Kohanga when I was little, but then after Kohanga, back in those days, there was no um, kura. Like, so you, you went into mainstream education and you didn't learn any reo, and my parents didn't speak reo, so then it just disappeared, you know? And then, so as an adult, I started doing, like, te reo courses at the Wananga and stuff, and at the time that I wrote Whakawhetu, I was doing a te reo course, and I thought, okay, sweet, how... How do I incorporate the reo into Māori tanga, and at the same time, it helped me have a little bit of reo in my life every day, you know, because I didn't have anyone to talk to in the, in the reo, and so it helped me practice, and then, yeah, and so, like, it just, when I decided to write the journal, it, it was always going to be bilingual. Yeah. Like, I didn't, it wasn't even, I didn't even think of doing it in just in English. Yeah. 
I think you've done what, you, what you've done is re- very clever because it doesn't come. I think, like you said, um, not only for our Pacifica but our, our Tangata Whenua, but a, a lot of our, our, our other ethnicities and other European um, or New Zealanders, everyday Kiwis. Um, it's, it's non threatening, it's real um, user friendly. So, oh, yeah, cool. And they can they kind of pick it up now. Oh, I, want to, I, want to, I can speak um, Te Reo as well. I want to learn how to speak Te Reo as well. So, uh, what you've done is r- real clever, brother. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. So there are heaps of people, um, like I work on a project and um, it's run by a French company. And a couple of the French people and that, that I work with have picked it up and they've learned some new real words and, you know, a whole bunch of people that, that, that don't have any real in their life or whatever and they want a little bit, they've picked it up and they've learned it a little bit. Cool, man, awesome. Yeah, which makes me feel pretty cool. Yeah, you should, man. It's, it's cool because the landscape of today, like everyone knows how much of a struggle the reo has gone through historically, um, but it's just cool, like the timing of it just works out perfect because of the revitalization of the language and there's so many initiatives, um, like you talked about um, with um, the Wananga offering courses. And it's just really cool to see that even in, you know, our day-to-day lives and something like a gratitude journal, you know, there's still some exposure there to the reo and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's really cool um, to hear that part of, um, your identity, but also just, you know, being part of the bigger story with the, the language. Um, just thinking about um, identity, and um, I think I'd read before where you'd spent quite a bit of time, you know, at the path, tidying up and at the marae and riding horses and all that sort of stuff um, growing up. Like how, how much of a challenge or how has it been for you? Because I know there's a lot of us that struggle where, the language wasn't spoken in our home and so you know our grandparents spoke it or our parents spoke it but then growing up we weren't taught the language um, and then having to learn it as an adult i know there's a lot of us in that boat but what are some of your thoughts in terms of having to relearn the language and reconnect to your roots as an adult oh it's been it's been hard like you know it's not it's not learning a new language isn't 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 easy but it, it so yeah like, like like you mentioned like we grew up and my dad went diving and my nan lived next to the marae in, in Hawke's Bay. And so we were there all the time for different hui. And, but we would always walk out the back, you know, like like up the front with all the real speakers and everyone. And we'd go out the back to the cookhouse and that's where all the drinkers and the smokers <laughs> were. And, you know, we'd go and do the work, you know, because that was our role in the marae. And we knew our role and we, we, we did it well. And, and those roles are important, I think. And so we didn't. I never felt disconnected from my Māori tanga because we we had that role, and and like you know that's the cool thing about Māori tanga, and I, I think it might be the same in Pacific culture. Like everyone's got a job, you know, you go to a big hui, and everyone's got a job, and everyone knows how to do it. Like you have the one auntie that's telling everyone what to do, <laughs> but no one really listens. Everyone just kind of they just kind of know, like, and everyone sees oh. There's a job to be done, you know, the hangi needs to be laid and then next minute there's 10 people over there doing it or the dishes need to be done and there's people over there, you know. And so, in that way, I never really felt disconnected from my Māori tanga. But then, as I got a bit older, um, yeah, I just, I, I, I felt the need to learn the deal. And, yeah, it's been a cool journey so far. Like, and, and it's and it's... Yeah, it, it's cool to be able to get up in different places and speak Māori and I feel proud when, you know, when I'm at work and they're like, you know, because I'm the only Māori in the room, they're like, oh, can you do the karakia? And I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> sweet as, you know. And I, and I do feel a bit proud that I can, you know, rather because there's, well, I'm not the only Māori, I'm just the, the other fella there. He like puts his head down and doesn't look at them, you know. <laughs> but yeah, and so the learning reel has been sort of filling, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about filling that gap, but for me, yeah, it was it was real, like, but not, yeah, like I said, I didn't feel disconnected from my Māori tanga, but it definitely filled a gap, learning the real. Oh, cool. Yes, awesome. Because I know you, you, you speak, and uh, you mentioned the Te Whare Tapa Whā. Yeah. And it's obviously with um, your, your te reo, in terms of the, of what, the wairua, what's, um, in terms of, I'm just assuming that it does something for your wairau when you're speaking te reo, but also being able to write this journal, but also to, to share a bit of who you are and your heart 
to um, Aotearoa New Zealanders, New Zealanders in general? Yeah, I think in terms of, of wairua, like from the reo, I think I learned, learning reo has helped me to think more Māori. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, you know, like, like how, like it's quite a poetic language and quite a, a lovely language, you know, like, like how, like, you know, in English you might say like, you know, it's a, um, it's a, it's a hot day, but in Māori, like you, you might say, kapatu te ringo o Hinenui te you know, the hand of Hinenui te is struck, you know, and that's beautiful, you know, and I learnt, learning the reo has helped me think more Māori, I guess, and which makes you feel more connected to your tupuna and, yeah, and lifts your way to it, you know, because you're like, you know, man, I'm, I'm, I'm Māori, I'm, I'm proud, I think like a Māori, you know, it's, and it's cool. It's cool, man. And it gives, it gives, like, a deeper meaning to certain words, eh? Like, yeah. we might say, like, a, a word in English, like, uh, you mentioned it before, around, like, uh, holistic well-being, but then... Um, in Māori tongue, when you mention hauro and then explain, you know, there's different elements to it. Like, um, there's it's more meaningful, deeper, and and that worldview like enriches not only like what you're talking about, but it's infused in who you are. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like hauro like it's it's you know, it's how we used to do health. Back in the day, there was, you know, everything was important. Everyone had their role. There was nothing that was more important than anything else, you know. And we were all so connected to the whenua. And so, you know, and, and we, we treated the whenua the same as we would treat anyone else. So, holistically, we were never separate from anyone else. No one was better than anyone else. We weren't worse than anyone else. Everyone was the same. Everyone had their own role in, 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 in society, everyone had their own job and the whenua was the most important thing, you know, and the environment and we looked after it. That's cool. Are you able to, because, um, you know, many viewers might be tuning in and they might not have that understanding of te whare tapafa, and but you've incorporated it in your journal. Are you able to explain um, the Te Whare Tapawha, but then also why you used it in your in your journal? Yeah, so Te Whare Tapawha is like, like you said, I think in English they would call it holistic health, but it's about like making sure that you, you're just balanced, you know, that that your 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 tahatinana, your your physical health is, is in balance with your your um, tahahinengaro, your your um, mental health and your tahawairua, your spiritual health and your tahafano, your your family health. And like, if, you know, if you, you're, you know, you, you see it all the time, like with athletes that are, you know, physically, they're like on top of the world, you know, they're the best athletes in the world, but then mentally they're a bit, they're, they're a bit off or like, you know, they've, they've spent so much time in their sports that they, they've neglected their whanau, you know, like, so that's not as, as, as strong. And like, for Intifati Tapafa, in order to be truly holistically healthy or truly healthy and happy, they all need to be balanced. And like, it just makes sense to me, you know, like, like you, it's simple and it makes sense. And so like the reason that I put it in the journal is because it's the same. So what gratitude also did for me was it kind of gave me a little bit of focus. Like, like I said, not, not sweating the small stuff. Mm. So not worrying about, you know, I'm a little bit fat, you know, like, like it's all good, who cares? Mm. But like, and so then if, if you can take that and go, okay, I'm going to put that into my taha tinana and be grateful for that, then you'll set intentions, like, like subconsciously, if you're thinking about your taha tinana, you'll go, oh, sweet, I'm going to go for a walk or whatever. And the same with your taha wairua, your taha whanau and all of that. And so that's why I put it in the journal because I wanted, like, I wanted everyone to, to, to be more intentional 
about each aspect of their lives. Mm. And also identify it, because eh? sometimes it's hard to um, assess those things about yourself. We always think, of, when we think about mental health, all we're doing is thinking about, oh, what are we thinking about? But we neglect the other um, elements in our, you know, our whole being. And, you know, we're, we're constantly, and so that means we're being intentional about one thing. Oh, how can I increase my mental health, my, my psychological well-being? But, Neglecting all the other areas of your life, and we, yeah, and so that's cool. Like, you bring intent once you identify certain elements of your well being, you'll be you can be more intentional about it. So, that, that's awesome, yeah, yeah, 100%. Like, and like, and that's the cool thing about Te Whare Tapa Fa is that, like, you know, it, it just illustrates like that, like, exactly what you said. Mm-hmm. Like, if, if you're living more intentionally, then you're more aware. Um, you, 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 you know, and if you're intentional about all aspects of your of your health, then that, that's got to be much better. Cool. I'm gonna mm. stop um, being because I always like I get gout. Yeah. And then <laughs> I always feel down, <laughs> but I'm gonna try to like be grateful that you got gout. I can still. Do other stuff in bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a bad example. Damn, get this out. <laughs> You're Tartina, no? <laughs> Man, do you think it's um it's harder for people to be intentional today than it was previous previously? Yeah, I think because we're so distracted, you know. Like you know, our phones are everywhere. Like I, I just recently. I'm on this mission to try and limit, uh, uh, minimize the amount of time I spend on my phone. So I deleted TikTok, I deleted Facebook, I deleted Instagram, and I, I still look at them, but I have to download them and then start again. So I like have to actually, it's, it's not easy. And like I found myself more like, just, just more, um, Oh, what's the word like? Um, more like in, like um, present. So just more present. Like, you know, like instead of sitting there scrolling my phone, I'll I'll, I'll pick up a book or whatever, or like you know, or I'll write something, or I'll go and pet my dogs or talk to my girlfriend. You know, instead of sitting on the couch for two hours watching TikTok. <laughs> Your girlfriend must be grateful now, eh? Oh, she sits on her. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you write uh, that night? So okay. no. I'm grateful that um, she's... Because <laughs> um, um, she's ungrateful. Cause <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's awesome. Um, you know, obviously, like I said before, um, you know, I think this is perfect timing. Obviously, obviously you notice the, the climate of the world today, uh, the economy and all these other stuff, global global issues around the world and bro I think people need to really kind of check in on themselves but also to be grateful and so I'm just wondering it, when the books and the sales because were you, were you surprised when when they started selling like hotcakes where you just you just knew that like, man this is going to be awesome for everyone no nah, no nah. so I um so when we first did it we I self-published it I didn't even know how to publish a book I had to google it so I googled it how do you publish a book and then it brought up, oh, you should reach out to a self-publisher or you can go to a to a um, publishing company. And I was like, oh, no publishing company is going to want to do this, you know. Like, it's quite a niche thing. And so I self-published it and I got 50 printed. Well, no, I was going to get 50 printed. And my girlfriend said, oh, get 200. And then if we're still selling them in a few months, then, um, then sweet, no dramas. And then so... Those first 200 sold in three days. And then, yeah, so we got another 500 and they sold before they arrived. <laughs> and then, yeah, Fair. and then it just went nuts. And then, so then I reached out to a publishing company because, you know, there were nights where we were up till like three in the morning packaging and sending books and stuff. And I'd still have to get up for work at six o'clock, you know, and I was like, oh, this is too much. And then so I emailed a few publishers and then... Alan and Unwin, who published it, republished the new version, they rang me back in like 10 minutes and they were like, yep, sweet. They didn't even ask anything. They were just like, yeah, sweet, we'll do it. 
And I was like, oh, yeah, so I've self-published this book. And I didn't know that 4,000 copies was heaps. And so I was like, I've sold 4,000 copies and it's got a bit bigger. Do you think you could help us out? And then they were gobsmacked. They were like, how did you sell 4,000 copies? And I was like, oh, just on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and, they <were> like, <laughs> and they had me like, I, I went to meet with the marketing department and they were like, oh, what sort of marketing did you do? And I was like, oh, Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> Man. Yeah, and it's gone, yeah, it's gone crazy. I didn't, I really didn't expect it. Like, we were the best-selling non-fiction title, um, best-selling uh, New Zealand title, best-selling, our second best-selling book overall. The only the one the only one better than us was like an international bestseller, and then we were that was there for like a month, and then we've been in the top ten best-selling books for or best-selling non-fiction books for a few months now. Jeez. That's cool, man. Does yeah. it buzz you up that you that the fact that people have a book of yours that you created and that yeah you got a book <laughs> yeah yeah it is pretty buzzy like I forget a lot yeah. and then like I'll, I'll I'll um you know I'll see something on someone will tag me on something on on Instagram or Facebook and I'm like oh that's pretty cool and then like yeah a couple of times I've been places like. You know, I went to uh, my neighbor's house and they had like a street party thing and I went there and I took them a book as a bit of a koha and then they already had two and then they're like, oh, we've already got one and then I was like, oh, kwa to tell you kai to he and they're like, oh, did you write it? I was like, yeah. And then they're like, oh, can you sign it and stuff? <laughs> and then like at, at my work, I went to a course and the, one of the tutors there was talking about um, mindfulness and gratitude and I said, oh, have you, I've got a, I wrote a gratitude journal. And then he was like, oh, yeah, is that fucker Feta? I've got one. Oh, and then he went and got it and can you sign it? And then, <laughs> then they got me to do some talks at, at, at the, the Link Alliance, at the, the project that I work for. And a bunch of people bought their versions and oh, their copies in. And yeah, it's crazy. Because <sighs> what is it telling you, Amita? What is it telling you in terms of what people are wanting and, and needing? Oh, I think so. I wrote it. During um, during lockdown, during the second lockdown, like I ran out of ran out of supplies from Mitre Ten, and Mitre Ten wasn't open, so I was like, "Oh, what am I going to do now?" And then I was like, oh, "I'll I'll carry on with this journal," and then I think, like, you know, coming out of COVID, everyone was a bit down, and you know, the world's been a bit of in a bit of a slump, and like, yeah, I think people just needed something to pick them up a little bit, like. Like, it should be, like, like you know, mental health is real, you know, and this might not, you know, mental health problems are real and I don't know that gratitude is going to gonna fix that. Like, and, and you know, if, if, if you do have mental health issues, you're probably better off going to see a therapist or something like that. But what gratitude can do is, is just help you to recognise those good things instead of getting stuck in that rut, like, of the media telling you, oh, you know, everything's mm -hmm. too expensive and life is shit and blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and just taking a moment to go, hey, you know, it's not so bad. I've got my family, you know, we've got food, we've got the power still on. You know, if, if, the, if the best thing you did today was wake up, you know, that's still pretty good. Yeah, yeah. bro. And, yeah, and again, what a need, especially a time like, you know, after lockdown, it was... Everyone's feeling down and a lot of blame. You know, everyone's doing the blaming game. Okay, man, the government, crap, uh, they put us in this. And and, so, and then that negativity like breeds like a uh, negative perspective, but, but also bitterness. And then um, having something like this like can shift the, the, the attitude and the thinking. And, and it's so cool. Like, like you said, you can focus on the good things that are happening. Instead of complaining heaps about ten dollar eggs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three, twenty dollar eggs. No, I'm grateful for uh, the beans in my <laughs> in my fridge. Yeah, man. yeah, hundred percent. Like you know, and and the like the journal wasn't just got gratitude in it, so it's also got um, it, it, every few pages it's got little um, sort of reminders, and one of them's called to have a wahinengaro, a bit of a mindfulness moment, just to stop and breathe 
and just just be in the moment be in like count your breath take a big deep breath count one two three four breathe out one two three four you know and that helps quiet your mind because I think everyone like gets sometimes gets a bit overwhelmed with life you know like and you, you know you get those million and one thoughts going on in your head like oh you know I've got to get home and do this for the kids or I've got to get home and clean this or I've got to do this for work or I've got this bill to pay and then all of a sudden those thoughts get overwhelming so it's always good to sort of just take a moment and you can do it any time during the day whenever like I do it probably multiple times a day because my, my mind just gets away on me you know and then I find myself thinking so much and then I'll be like okay sweet stop and then I'll just breathe and so it's got a reminder every few days in there just to breathe just to stop and breathe and like something simple like that can help stop those negative thoughts I love that man, that's so man. Cool. It's and cool it's, that it's like counter programming everything. Like just hearing about, you know, everything that you read online or in the news. Like it's always the negative stuff that sells or that gets people's yeah, attention. Yeah. So they spin that a lot. And um, you know, even just living life, like going to a mahi and providing and all that sort of stuff. It's so full on. Sometimes the answers are in the the simple things yeah. um like stopping to breathe or being grateful um yeah it's just really interesting to see that dynamic of the way the world is versus something so simple but almost timeless like it doesn't matter where the world's going to be at we can always choose to be grateful yeah 100% mm. man and like at that that sort of thinking just translates into other parts of our lives you know like like, you know, again, uh, like, you know, sometimes if I'm annoyed at my girlfriend, I'll just, I'll just remind myself, like, you know, of, of a few things that I love about her, you know, and then pretty soon that, that, that I'm not annoyed anymore. I'm like, oh, okay, then I'll send her a text. Oh, hope you're having a good day. You know, instead of sitting there pissed off that she got me to do too many jobs in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> He takes a break. I still love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's also got like, so in there, I think it's also important not to ignore those negative feelings because they do mm. happen, you know. And, and, and it's important that you don't just pretend that everything is all good and you, and, and you push those feelings deep down because then they come back. And so it's got, um, out the back, it's got a section called Ngamura Kihu and it's just for ramblings and you can write whatever you want in there. And then it's got um, a prompt every few days um, called a whakaputa kōrero expression. And so that's just for you to express however you're feeling, you know, like whether you're feeling, whether you've had a bad day or a good day or whether you want to tell someone that you love them or, I don't know, you probably shouldn't, like, if you want to tell them that they annoyed you, you can do that too. Mm -hmm. But So it's just the whakaputa kōrero is just a reminder that, that, that those negative feelings they do exist, they do happen, they're normal, and you, you don't need to just ignore it because that's not what gratitude's about. That's awesome. Um, obviously, you had to be intentional about what you were putting in that journal because, you know, it's not like you just, during lockdown, you just whipped up, so you go, oh, yeah, hopefully this sells. And it sounds like um, there was a lot of internal work that you already were, gone through and you got these tools um for you in terms of like how you look at life what helps you slow down and be mindful um are you able to talk about where you picked up these these tools and yeah i don't know really like, yeah. <laughs> like I, so I did I, I did a um our property investment course we were trying to buy a house and we didn't even know how to buy a house and then so we did this property investment course with, with, with a property group called Asset Lab. And they're really cool, man. Like, like they're so awesome. I thought it was just going to be like, you know, rich people. But they were just real down to earth, like normal dudes. Like let's do Phil and Sally and Janine. Like they were so cool. And one of the first things they got us to do was um, was do the journal, the original journal that I got. And, um, that, and then they also taught us about like mindfulness and doing things with intention, goal setting, all that sort of stuff. And I guess that sort of, 
like I think I guess that's kind of where it started and then I just started reading books about and listening to books about mindfulness and meditation and all that sort of stuff that's cool and I've always sort of been into meditation like like you know back before it was cool like and everyone made fun of you and stuff like my, <laughs> my best mate's dad um he was hard out into meditation he used to meditate heaps and so you know we were we were like 15 in the like in the 90s talking about meditation and, and shit you know like <laughs> and so i was always from like a teenager i was always open to mindfulness and meditation and all that sort of stuff that's awesome that's cool like Things that you've picked up and along the way that you're able to share, you know, share it. Because we think that people know this stuff, and um, but we just go about life doing, you know, just doing life. We're always doing, but not we're not being. And, and sometimes these little tools, especially for our people, like really help enrich what they're doing, sort of pause and reflect on like what's going on. And so, like, I, I like, I love that there's, like, a, a journal, or a tool for people just to learn learn stuff that um, help others. Yeah, and it's really simple. Like, yeah. it's got, like, so the, the front of the journal explains how it all works. So, cool. like, it's not just, you know, it, it, it guides you through it. It tells you exactly what to do, gives you examples on what to put in, what to write down, and, and, and it's really simple and anyone can use it and you know like yeah exactly like you said like just taking and I think that's the benefit of writing it down is that you have to separate yourself from everything else mm. and this is for that moment that little that five minutes every day you're only thinking about good stuff mm. and you're only thinking about you know you're taking a moment for yourself what are your thoughts on Hida because Obviously, this, this uh, obviously the whole world has been going through some stuff in the last three to four years. But when you think of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and, and why, why in terms of more so our, our people, uh, Pacifica and Tangata Whenua, is it, why has there been kind of? And I'm just I'm just speaking from my own experience. Has there been, or and you may be, it might be totally different for you, and for the brothers, but has there been a, like a like I don't know for our people? Has there been some sort of like a oppression in terms of uh, hardships and the things in the history and so forth what are your thoughts on that in terms of and why gratitude can kind of be a healing point or uh, or starter for our for our people yeah i don't yeah i think um yeah i think we've kind of um I think people in general have kind of lost their way but for Māori and pacific people i think the journal like, can sort of it's something you can identify with and say, hey, "This is ours," you know. It's not anyone else's. Like, you know, like I, someone in America bought some stuff, but it's not for them. It's for us, you know. And you look at it, and you know, it's uniquely New Zealand, and it's ours. And I think, like, yeah, I don't know. That's that's a tough question to answer. I don't think it's going to solve the world's problems. Like, you can't just gratitude your way out of out of your <laughs> life you know like you got to be realistic but it can just help you be a little bit more happier live a little bit more intentionally and yeah i think yeah i i, I just think it can only be good eh? awesome bro good uh, have you received a lot of great feedback like uh, or stories around the purchase of your book yeah yeah it's been amazing like like um you know, I've had a few messages about, like, there was one one I got that sticks out and she talked about how she had been um, looking for a journal that resonated with her and, and um, she couldn't find one and she tried another couple of journals and then she saw it and then she was like, she felt like the journal found her and she'd been filling it in every day and it had just changed her life and all of this. And then another guy wrote me, uh, sent me a message and said, hey, bro, I just want to thank you. This book has changed my life. And, you know, that he, he was telling me how he does does it for himself in the morning, but then at night him and his family sit around and how he's got more close with his family. And, like, you know, hearing those things is, is, is you know, that's kind of why I did it. You know, the, the, the like, I never thought it would sell this much. 
um, it was kind of just like, you know, if I can do this thing and make a few people feel better, then then that's cool. And and it's gone, it's gone way better than I ever expected. Yeah. And that's, that's so cool. Sure. And you're so humble about um, everything mm. that you've shared so far. Um, you know, being able to create something like this and then seeing it impact people's lives, do you ever have to keep yourself in check sometimes from being like, man, I am the man? Like, <laughs> I have the fucking fit time. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, nah. I don't, I, I, my girlfriend is like, always says that. And I talk about her a lot. Eh? I didn't. I only just realised that. <laughs> That's good, <laughs> but, man. That's good. But anyway, she 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 we always, she was saying this the other day that like, and I think it's sort of probably the same for a lot a lot of Maori and Pacific people is that we we, we kind of suffer from imposter syndrome. You know, like even coming on here, I was like, oh, they wouldn't want to talk to me. You know, they had Kuehs people, like you know, they had Butterbean and they had Robbie Magasiva and they had all of these famous people. Why would they want to talk to me? And then you guys said yes, and I was like, oh, sweet. And then I just kept waiting for you guys to cancel. Like, <laughs> no, no, but she was like, and then I said, oh, they, don't, they won't want to talk to me. And like, you know, with a lot of things that I do, like, like I'm an electrical engineer for the link on the biggest infrastructure project in New Zealand, or in history. And, um, you know, when I got the job, I was like, oh, I think they made a mistake, you know? like, <laughs> like And so I think we, we, we suffer a lot from imposter syndrome and so it makes us I guess sometimes not try as hard as we should so I, I don't often feel like oh, I have to keep my self in check because I feel like I shouldn't be here do you know what I mean yeah, yeah. Uh, but then on the flip side of that like I'm also real grateful so it makes me more grateful when I do get to do things like come on this podcast <laughs> you know I'm, I'm real grateful and so yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I don't often get ahead of myself. That's good, That's man. Awesome. Perhaps, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer. I don't even know the answer. Maybe the brothers might know as well. But why does imposter syndrome? Like, I'm sure we've all felt it at our in, at some time in our lives. Perhaps we're still feeling it now. But why do we feel imposter syndrome so badly, um, especially amongst our people, our men? It just seems like. You could ask anyone in your circle and more than likely they will have gone through some form of imposter syndrome. That's a good, that's a good question, that's man. That's a good question. That is a good question, man. Because I've been, I've been hearing that lately now. Um, here's mm. the, everywhere I go now, is people oh, imposter syndrome. So I, I, don't, I don't know. I just, I don't know if it's a new thing or it's always been there, but now they've just kind of labelled it or had, had a special, mm. specific name for imposter syndrome. I don't know. I just... Um, uh, I think for me personally, like, because I, it sounds like a new term, uh, but uh, that, you know, we've put a name to something that we've probably felt over the years. But for me, when I hear it, I'm, you know, so I know I, I can identify with it and like, just like what the brother was saying. And um, I think for me, it's like more around my own insecurities and then that, always having that uh, battle of comparison you know we're always um and i think that's the killer of self-development it's like when you're always comparing to someone else like oh no they're better than, than me i should um i don't belong here and then so um i guess the way i need to uh identify that and like grow from it is like Oh no! Nah. Like lately, there's spaces that I would go into, and especially like spaces where there's not many of um, people like that look like us. And so, if I go like into a corporate city before, I feel like oh man, I should be uh, um, I feel intimidated. Uh, but lately, um, just over the past few years, I'm going nah. I do belong here. Like I have something to offer. Like there's there's something. I'm I'm unique. I'm, uh, no one is like me, and um, so uh, you know there's the confidence that um, because we're different, but we all can like contribute and help each other out. That that sort of things that. But I figure it probably always pops up now and then. Uh, but and to our brother, like in terms of you, man, it's a privilege to have you here. <laughs> like um, yeah, um, I guess. We have different guests that come on. Um, we've got celebrities, we've got um, you know musicians, um, 
riders and but for us like whoever sits on that chair um we see the same like um when we don't um identify you by what you do on a we don't identify you but what made you de- get there but um we want to hear the the story behind um who you are and that that book does it like um I guess that book and all the accolades that you're going to end up getting doesn't define who you are, but um, that's part of what you do. And um, and we're just grateful that you you chose us to <laughs> to come and have a talanoa. Yeah. And we see everyone the same. And, and um, yeah, and we're just grateful that, man, we've got the also... <laughs> the brother here. The man. brother here um, sharing your story and... And even sharing about, you know, you went to study for three years and just partied. <laughs> <laughs> and I like yeah, it. was so funny here, like, there, there was no imposter syndrome then, eh? Three, oh no, I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> three, three years. Yeah, yeah. I like how you talked about because sometimes when we ask people questions or like, well, you know, when you're interviewing someone, you're always looking for like a deep, deep, like, I said, okay, ooh, I wonder what the, like, oh, I was just partying for three years. <laughs> and and that, that, that sort of talks about the person you are like you're real like if one thing doesn't work and you, you know you're just cruising okay i just pivot yeah, then, yeah, yeah but you're always looking for uh, I, don't, I don't know if you're intentionally looking for it but whatever is in front of you is like oh, okay i'll try to make this work like i love the story about um the writing you know um for kickboxing and then you know you're good at it. And go, oh man, I want to get a feed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to get a cup of cup, cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. And then look where it took you. So, I think there's so much to learn in that, like um, grow in what you have in front of you, and just keep on looking at ways to you know, how to utilize it. And you, you've been around the world. You're, um, you're Sparky. You're a writer, and you do all these other things. And I think it's amazing because we sort of someone that's from our background that looks like um, us our ethnicity we sort of just caught up in our hood and and we're not exposed to what's out there and but we we know that um, we're a multi part of talent and gifts and, and so like I love that you're able to like show some of that so no, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I rambled on. No, no, I'm just, just going off your book, you. you know. There's a rambling part in there, so I'm just <laughs> rambling. <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Like I think, and I think you're right. Like I, I think there's so many talented people out there, Maori and Pacific people that look like us, and I think that's part of the thing with the imposter syndrome and stuff is that we're often we we we're, we're told to be humble, mm. you know, and and so like, but if we're allowed to be proud, then it shows, you know, the rangatahi that, hey, you know, I do belong there because he looks like me. He comes from the hood, you know, he comes from Hastings. He comes from, he grew up in Havelock and Flaxmere and, you know, and, and yeah. And so if they see people like them, like, you know, I think, um, oh, what's his name? Nigel Ladder, he, he had this, I watched him once and he had this, the, this term, the top of the mountain. Mm. And he said, everyone's top of the mountain is different, you know. And, you know, you, you, my my cousin's son one day was over at our house and he was like, oh, this was years ago, about 10, 15 years ago. And he's like, oh, what's that, uncle? And I was like, oh, it's a dishwasher. And he's like, oh, what does it do? He's like, it washes the dishes. And he was like, oh, me, when I crack the lotto, I'm going to get me a dishwasher. <laughs> You know, that was his top of the mountain, was a dishwasher. And we have other kids and they like see their friends and, and their family and they go on holidays to Hawaii and all over the world. You know, their top of the mountain is different, you know, to the top of that. So if we're out there and we're showing kids that grew up like how we grew up, a different top of the mountain, then they start to think, oh, we belong there. You know, we can get there, we can do that. And so I think that's how you change the imposter syndrome. You have podcasts like this that, that put our people out there and that show everyone else that we belong, you know? Yeah. Well said, man. Well said, man. That's well powerful. Said. But it's, it's interesting, hey, brothers, because sometimes we think of imposter syndrome and everyone else is thinking, man, no, you belong here. And we're the only ones in our own heads <laughs> thinking, I shouldn't be here. But everyone's like, no, no, we're here because of you. 
And said, bro, this is, without a shadow of a doubt, this is no way, this is not imposter syndrome, bro. This book, you, f- for, for you to write this, you have to have the skills and, and, the, and the, the grit and the knowledge to do this. Mm-hmm. And bro, this is, um, yeah, this is amazing. Uh, but it's so sad that um, we have to kind of, you know, we put ourselves, like you said, the humility part, oh, I don't know, but we need to kind of shine more and not be afraid to kind of um, get out, out of our comfort zones and just, hey, this is who I am, and let our young people, our rangatahi, like you were saying, and, uh, and people in general, yeah, if if Hida's out there, if Jamin and, and Charles or Brad, man, this, this is where I belong. And, and to make it normal, normal, I was like, man, yeah. wow, our people's out there, mm. oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to follow suit. It's just a normal thing for our people to succeed. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Yeah, awesome, bro. Good question as well, Jay. How about awesome? Oh, all good. In fact, for answer, end up answering the question because he he answered the question. <laughs> oh, he's been always <laughs> 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 Hey man, it's in here, man. Gratitude, man. It's just the brothers here you having a conversation. That's good, man. Yeah, I think it just came to mind just hearing the story about approaching the publisher. Like that must have been so. Mm. I would have felt scared to do it thinking, even if you had sold so many copies, that's such a big leap of faith because you don't know how they're going to react. And just, I think it takes so much courage to put yourself out there the way that you did. Mm. And hearing about your journey, it's kind of cool that your your passion for writing, it was always there. Like it never died, no matter what you were doing. Um, one of the things I, did, I was curious to go back to, um, just thinking about gratitude, it sort of made me think about perspective and the importance of perspective. And you'd mentioned earlier that you'd traveled overseas for a bit, and I do hear that traveling is good for broadening your horizons and and your perspective. Was there anything from your travels overseas that helped you see things differently in the world compared to just where you'd grown up or just being here in New Zealand? Yeah, like, so I, like where I grew up, like Havelock's real rich, but like they, so in Havelock, they put all of the state houses and all of the, you know, affordable housing in one corner. So all of the poor people lived in one corner of the village. And like, you know, we were, I call it Havelock's shitty little secret. You know, we were, <laughs> we were down the back. And so I grew up in a real poor area. So we were quite humble. And so like everything was a gift, you know, like, and like, but in traveling, I, um, so I volunteered at this orphanage in the Philippines and, and this place called Tondo, which is a, an area in um, Manila, and you go in there and the kids are just like, they're so grateful. Like you give them an apple and they're like, oh, can I take this apple home to share? It's like, man, you can do whatever you want with it. It's just an apple. You know, and you give them a packet of biscuits and they save it and they're so grateful and they, they you know, a lot of them don't go to school and these are like six and seven year old kids because their parents can't afford to send them to school. So the only schooling that they got was the hour that they got to come to the orphanage. But then... They, and that was real sad and humbling that, you know, and just made me realise how lucky we really were. But then there were kids that had been, that were orphans, like little babies, and you weren't allowed to touch them because they, um, they could only have like a certain mo- amount of contact time because they didn't want to get them used to being touched. And I was like, man, that's heartbreaking, you know, like there's these little babies and you just want to give them a hug, but you're not allowed to. Like, and it was, yeah, it was very humbling. Jeez. That's cool. The, you know, when you grew up in your area, um, were you a troubled kid or um, did, you, did you have a close knit family that kept you in line? Oh, I wasn't allowed to be troubled because my dad had just given me a hiding. No, I had I, my parents were amazing, you know, my mm. dad worked and saved up and we, we, we owned our own house in, in the area and he, he did his plumbing apprenticeship and my mom worked real hard and stuff so I had, I had really good examples growing up but like there was heaps of like rough stuff went on around us you know lots of violence and like most of my family are, are gang members and my dad he's like I think all of his brothers are in the Mongol mob but except for him and I was like asked him one day I said how come how come you didn't join the Mongol mob and he's like oh I got a job and he was like, oh, the rest of them had nothing to do, so they joined the gang. And I was like, so I, I was lucky that that I got my dad. You know, he was he was he was awesome. He was a hard worker, and so was my mum. And yeah, and even though we grew up in a rough area, and like I still had awesome examples, and yeah, I was really lucky. 
That's awesome. Uh, I only ask because, you know, again, when we go back to our people and especially those from low social um, economic demographic, um, it's easy. Like there's two pathways. Like you end up going, you know, making good choices or you end up uh, choosing a path so you can survive. And some of it, you know, it's not path we wanted to choose but because for some whatever reason we're like in survival mode and and um and we've got a lot of young people that are still you know that's these two different paths that they have to choose and so hearing your story around like you know man you had no choice in terms of like you had positive influences around even though your circumstances um, might have said hey there's this other pathway come, you know, you got family members here, but um it was, you know, um you had good influences in your life that kept you away from it. Yeah, I think they like I think everyone wants to go down the good path, you know. Yeah. It's just that like some 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 people just don't know how, you know, they no one teaches them and everyone forgets about them and you know, they just see this troubled kid that, that turns up to school and is a little shit and you know, and I don't blame the teachers because they got 30 other kids to worry about. They can't spend the whole day looking after one kid, you know, if that, that, that's being difficult. And like, you know, and then they go home and their parents don't care. They go to school and they get lost in the system, you know, and then they go to, they get locked up and then no one cares about them and stuff. And then, you know, then they turn into adults that, that are doing the same thing. And everyone goes, oh, well, they've got a choice. Well, no, they've never had a choice, you know. They they were kind of forced down this path that was that was that was paved for them before. Some people get out, and and some people don't. You know? mm. But well, if no one shows them, you know, like I was lucky because someone showed me where to go, you know. And I had other good good examples in my life. Like my uncle, he travelled heaps, so I was like, "Yep, I'm going to travel the world." Mm. Yeah, and that's cool. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, just. Funny that you mentioned um, teachers. I was going to ask, I heard that you had a teacher called Mr. Blake at St. John's College, and I was going to ask about the power of a good teacher. What makes a teacher a good teacher? Oh, he was also Mr. Blake. Like He just made, I don't know, he, he, he was funny, but he, he made us feel like we belonged in the classroom, you know? Like, and everyone, not just the Māori kids. Like He was my Māori teacher, but like everyone enjoyed his classes, like, and we all learnt heaps, and we were all engaged. Yeah, I don't know. I can't. I don't know specifically what it was about his teaching style or whatever. But I just remember I felt like, you know, like I belonged in that classroom, and that Mr. Blake was awesome, and I wanted to be there. Some of these little things like make a massive difference eh, in terms of just affirming someone and. You know, we went to schools. Oh, Pete was probably in the scholar class, but I remember <laughs> being just say one thing, okay? Idiot, go to the left side of the room or the back. <laughs> Someone <laughs> said it. Did. Yeah, that's harsh. Yeah. There was, there was, there was, there was. Yeah, I remember. Oh, I don't know if I should. Yeah, I said the story. So just off. I'm rambling, but um, I remember I was a senior. <laughs> I was like year 13 or something the, the teacher was talking He was teaching But you know how you can see um, If you do something The shadow is on um, With his one And I was like poke, um, <laughs> Poking him Like his nose My shadow I was I was at the back And I was going like that And everyone was laughing And he He turned around And he goes Go to um, the, the This other teacher Go to Mr. Hurst class And it's the It was the intermediate um, School and I had to go, and he must have called him. He goes, oh, I'm sending this idiot down, I'm teaching him a lesson. And I went there, and the arrow goes, hey, everyone say hi to this big idiot. And he goes, sit at the back, and you've got all these little kids, like, just laughing at me. And I was going, oh, man, that was so embarrassing. But, yeah, stories of my rambling childhood. So, sorry, guys, rambling again. <laughs> yeah. but who, was, who was the teacher? Who was it? Um? <laughs> Mr. Wilson, gee, I'm going to come and see Wilson. you. Gonna, oh, nah. I'm grateful for Mr. Wilson. <laughs> but it's interesting, though, because it's funny how, like, there's these experiences in your childhood that resonate with you. Like, they might be positive, they might be negative, but you just never know which experiences are going to stick with you for life. Like, you'll always remember how you felt in those yeah. moments. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know how we're having this conversation now. Like, you know, 
maybe in five, ten years, you know, the thought that these kids are going to become adults. One day they're going to say, hey, Mr. Busby said this about me. You know, that thought, how cool is that? That is cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that I get excited about the most is like seeing the students years from now and just hoping that they've done well or hoping that you've made some small mm. difference. But yeah. even if not, like just knowing that they're okay, yeah. I think I'd be cool with that. Yeah, like I don't, I, I never told like, because Mr. Jo- everyone hated Mr. Jones, so like you know it wasn't cool to like her. So I never, <laughs> yeah, 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 I yeah. never really told her that that like you know when I was naughty and I get kicked out of class, I'd go go and see Mrs. Jones. I'll be like, oh sweet, she likes me anyway. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, and I'll go there and she'll be like, oh just tell me to write something, and I'll be like, oh yeah, cool, and I'd write like a short story or something, and she'd read it and she'd be like, oh it's amazing, and like you know it was like our little secret that that and. I don't know that I, I've never told her. I don't know if she's still alive because she was a bit old. And then, yeah, I've never told her that that that, that like was a, a good memory from high school. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's cool. Good, that's good, eh? I know just from like my previous teachers, like they live for that stuff, eh? Like I've gone back to the, there's like three teachers that inspired me to be a teacher. And I made sure I tracked them down to be like, man, Thank you. Like I learned life lessons from being in their class, and often I find that's for, for myself what separated them from the other teachers was everyone could teach about writing or reading or maths in some way, shape, or form. But the teachers that I remember were the ones that taught me about life. Sometimes it was unintentional, and it was only upon reflection that I was like, "Bro, that's a mean life lesson. I should remember that," and it just always stuck. Um, but yeah, I, I, I know it really warms their heart that even now I'll reach out every now and then and just give them the old thank you like you know appreciate you kind of thing but yeah it's cool that you gave the shout out to to Mm -hmm. Mrs. Jones Jones, you know whether she's here or not or she she sees it but just to voice it and get it out in the open I think it's cool there but like I think yeah we could probably do it not just teachers but just with everyone Mm -hmm. that sort of has makes a difference in our life like if I think about like a pivotal moment in my life because like, now you got me thinking about <laughs> life moments you know like I, I met this lady in Argentina like the traveling again and I met this lady in Argentina I mean she was this big tall skinny white lady with real long dreadlocks and I started talking to her because she was like funny looking because she's like seven foot and she's got the long dreadlocks and then I started talking to her and she's a raster <laughs> and I was like oh this is out of it because I love reggae music and we started talking about reggae and stuff and then Anyway, we, we went on this boat tour and then the tour finished and then later that night I went to go out for dinner and she was at the same restaurant and but all the tables were full and I was like, Oh you can come sit with us. I was like, Oh yeah, cool. And then we sat down and um she was a sociology professor professor somewhere in America and she talked to me about like um she said like she said, Oh you're Maori. I was like, Yeah and then she talked to me about how colonised cultures and marginalised cultures often stay quiet. They don't say much. And, like, especially in, like, meetings and things, everyone will stay quiet. You don't say anything because you know your place. That's your place. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's me. You know, even if I've got something to say, I won't say it. And then, like, she was also talking about how, like, often, like, marginalised or people won't try and go to the next level because they've been taught to be grateful for where they are, where they are. So they'll be like, okay, I'm lucky to have a job, so I'm not going to go for team leader or I'm not going to go for supervisor because, man, I'm good where I am. You know, I'm making good money. And I was like, oh, that's me. And then I really resonated with me. And then I came back, back to New Zealand, and I was like, okay, sweet, I'm not going to be quiet anymore. I'm I'm not going to settle. I'm going to just try my best at everything. And it changed my life. Like, from then, from that day, like, I was just like okay, I'm going to try everything and I'm going to give it 100%. Oh, wow. Man, that's encouraging. That's cool. Argentina? Yeah. Woman. No, no, she was American, but she American. was... Yeah, and she was, she was, she was cool. Like, and it was just a random conversation in this restaurant in Argentina and it changed my life. Jeez. Man. I love experiences like that. Yeah, yeah. It's so awesome because you never know what you're going to learn from strangers. And then sometimes I'm always like, man, I wonder what they got up to after that. Like... Did you, do you remember the name of the? No. 
And I reckon it's like a little bit more magical like yeah. that, you know, like, yeah, like yeah. mystery. It's Robert's like mysterious. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. And wow. like, and she was right, you know, like if you, like if you think about like, and so back then I was real quiet. Like I kind of didn't say anything at all, really. Like I was, I was the dude that turned up to the parties and like with my head down and walked in and just talked to the people that I knew. And then so I had to practice talking to strangers, you know, and so I started by practicing talking to the shopkeeper and then, like, I had to practice talking to strangers because I was like, okay, I'm not going to be quiet anymore. And then, so that's how I started. And then just slowly, and now, now I don't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but how much True. of, um, how much has that, like, changed your life? Because I, I know a lot of people that are quite reserved and then too, uh, but it's related to put themselves out there and, like, and so hearing your story, that's been amazing. Look what you've gone on to do. Yeah, yeah. Man. I think like, yeah, no, it was it was it was, it was a pivotal moment in my life because like, because then I went to work and I was like, okay, I, I'm going to be a team leader. And then like, you know, not long after that, they I was the team leader. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to tell them I want to be the supervisor. And when everyone was like, okay, I want to be the supervisor. What do I have to do? And they said, I oh, will put you on this course, put you on this course. Okay, sweet. And I was like, okay, I want to get on the leadership development course. How do I get on that? And then they said, oh, yeah, we think you'd be a good candidate. And then no one said anything. So I, so I said that to my boss. Then I went to his boss and I said, oh, I want to be on the leadership development program. How do I get on that? And he said, oh, yeah, we think you'd be a good good candidate. But they didn't put my name in. So I point to his boss and then said, oh, these two guys said that I'd be good for the leadership development program. How do I get on that? And they said, oh, we'll just sign you up. And then so he signed me up, you know, like. And so I just, yeah, and then I got the job as the contract manager. And then, yeah, now I'm an electrical engineer on the, for the city railing. Yes. And so, like, just not being quiet mm. and asking for things just changed my life, you know. And like you said, it's like reaching out to the publishers and saying, hey, can you help me with this? That's changed my life. <laughs> Because it sounds like there's a change of thinking and so you, it changes the way there's an intentionality of what you do. So you go speak it and then the actions follow or I don't know, I try to think of, figure out like like yeah. the whole, how, you know, putting yourself out there changes your trajectory of, of life. Yeah, like 100%. If, if, there's a saying I remember Closed mouths don't get fed And so, yeah. <laughs> and so like You're you um, You know You're that person that man, and Open I, your mouth and <laughs> I think that's another thing With gratitude Like like what it showed me Was that You know If, if you're grateful For all of the things And little things in your life Then you've got enough And so if yeah. you're starting From a place where you have enough when you ask for something, like you ask to go, oh, can I go on the leadership development program? And they say, no. Like, okay, it's all right, because I've already got enough. You know, like, I'll go off and do this thing. Okay, I'll go try to write a book. You know, if that doesn't work out, then, you know, it's okay, because I've got enough. Or I'll mm -hmm. go and try this thing, or like, whatever. And try or take risks and try all of these things, because if I fail, it doesn't matter, because I've got enough. Yeah. No, nothing goes to waste here, doesn't yeah. No. Nothing goes to waste. All the experience you've you yeah, kind of garnered from, even if, you know, some people might not make it, in, but hey, you've got all this experience. Bro, I'll tell you what, Hida, people who are watching this and listening to this, and I can imagine because a lot of our people and our Dunga the Fenua are thinking, man, that's me. I don't say enough. I'm too quiet. I'm too reserved because I don't want to, well, um, you know, I want to do this. I want to better myself, but maybe there's just a cap for me. I just as, as good as it gets for me. And bro, I think you may very well have changed a lot of people's perspectives. Like, man, that's me. I don't, why am I? Why am I settling, settling for less or for second best? Yeah, it's because I think we learn from a young age, like like Maori and Pacific people. Like when you crack a job, you know you've made it. You know you've made it. You got a job now. You made it. And they're not told, oh, you can be the CEO. You know, so they don't go hunting for that CEO job because they were told when you get a job. You know, you've cracked it, you've made it, you know. And everyone's like, oh, man, I've got a flat, I've got a job, you know. And and that's awesome, you know. If you're taking steps forward, that's awesome. But that's not the end, you know. you got to keep going, go a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. That's awesome, man. I think a lot of people are going to be really encouraged. 
And I think that's what a lot of you, our men might just need just at this moment. Like, man, I just need a, I just need an extra nudge. I need a bit of a bit of a push. So if he does doing that, and your story, obviously this has kind of amplified your voice in terms of not being quiet and the the, the book you've written. And so I think a lot of our men need to hear what you just said, or, or listen to, or just visualize. Oh man, I can do better than, than what I'm doing right now. Yeah, hard out like just and just give it a try. You know, like. Like, you know, I gave the journal a try and it's, you know, it's, it's, we're up to 14,000 copies now I've sold. And I thought, I, you know, at the time I, I, I thought it might sell 50 and I just went, all right, I'm going to give it a go. You know, and so if you're thinking about something or you want to do something or you've got this good idea, just give it a crack. You know, you got nothing to lose. To lose, yeah. And I like that because it sort of touches on like the other part of, imposter syndrome is like that fear of failure like everyone and we sort of talked about um, social media and things like that and you know everyone's even more terrified to fail because you know no one wants to be a meme or thrown up online and going viral all that sort of thing um so it makes trying new things really scary but i've never heard it put that way before in terms of like starting in a place where we have enough like if we fail it's all good like we have enough um so I just, yeah, really grateful for that specific insight. That's definitely something <laughs> I can apply to myself. So, no, nah, just really interesting to to hear that take on it. Mm. <laughs> so good, so good. I'm a hitter. What's next for you, brother? Like you've written this journal. I hear there's another journal in the works. Yeah, yeah. So we got a kids one. I'm working with my 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 friend Jesse. She's a teacher out, out west, and um, yeah, she's helping us. We just finished the um, first draft. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell anyone. Actually, I'm not kidding. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> we'll edit that up. No. Oh. Nah, it's all good. We're pretty good down at the publishing company. <laughs> but like, yeah, so we just finished the first draft. It's pretty cool. I won't go into much detail because cool. the publisher might get angry. At me. <laughs> but. Um, um, yeah, no, I'm really excited. It's pretty cool, and everyone. So what we did, and I did the same thing with the with with my journal. I we sent out samples to people, and then we got them to give feedback, and we got some good feedback. And you know, and everyone's kind, and they say, "Oh, this is awesome." But that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for someone to go, "Okay, this was a bit rubbish. This was a bit rubbish." And we got a few of those, and we fixed some things up. And yeah, it's looking really good, I think. And the the publisher loves it, and. Our a book designer loves it and all the people we gave it to love it and so I'm really looking forward to getting that out. It's gonna be cool. That's Jeez. cool. That's awesome. Uh, do some oh. comic books too and some <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well I was just thinking this is just an idea and uh, man, we just probably should ah, we'll just, you know, we we'll have a conversation, but it'd be cool if we like for us boys, like um just to model um the effectiveness or and the journey of this journal, like we all get one each, and then, mm, and just kind then of we'll go through it together, like um, until we get to the end. Then, but in between, we keep on checking in on each other, and seeing how oh, um, how we are, and how, if there's been an impact or not. And yeah, if there's been a, a growth in our it's a good challenge. Yeah, 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 it'll be a cool challenge. Yeah. We'll call oh, it the. Cool. Uh, Fuck a fair tie date Fuck a fair yeah. tie challenge yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it Challenge yeah And we'll love tag it. you in And keep yeah. you in the loop It's cool Like I like hearing people Like I've heard a couple of people Use it Like the ways mm. Different ways they use it Like I said before There was that guy That, that does it in the morning For himself And then with his family yeah. At night And one of my friends She uses hers As a visitor book So when the visitors come in They have to put something That they're grateful for And sign it You know And heaps of people Use it in different ways And it's Yeah It's cool Yeah cool it's no. funny, as I was looking through the book before, I was like, this is, because I, I try to do things a little bit differently with my class, and I know my class, they need some of the wisdom in the book, and I try to think about ways that I can switch things up, and so reading, even just, I was literally browsing the book before we came in here, and I was like, bro, this is exactly what I need, so I was like, I'm going to give me a copy regardless for myself, but I just think there's some real cool gems there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, you know, to be able to pass on to my students. Um, yeah, so it's awesome. And it also reminded me of, um, I, for a couple of years, I had done this thing where I was like, the goal was to be grateful for something every day. And every day I would give thanks to something. And I did it for a couple of years. 
until I started teaching. Then I just was in such a dark place. It was such a struggle. Um, and I started this year and I haven't, I've done it maybe once this year. Um, and then I'd gone to see a counsellor today um, about plans for next year and um, trying to see the positive and things. And then just the timing of it to come in today to have you as our guest and then to see this. I was like, I don't believe in coincidence. So it's just the timing of it's been perfect. So I'm really grateful that we've been able to have a look at the book, but also just to meet the man behind it and mm. see. It feels like this was always part of your plan, even if you didn't know it at the time. It just seems like gratitude's always been sort of in the heart of who you are. But yeah, yeah. No, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the nice stuff you guys are saying. It's, it's very humbling. <laughs> yeah. no worries. You're, you're a humble man, humble man, but um, not in terms of kind of like a, a doormat or being subservient. You're a humble man in terms of you know who you are. You're proud of Dangata Whenua, proud of Māori, um, but also the passion and the purpose behind you know, your, your writings. Bro, um, man, thank you very much. Whafitai. Uh, and so I'm um, for your work, but also just just you, uh, just your, your your story, but also just your manner to come in and share with us, cut it all with um, with the men, and um, and share a bit of who you are and also your your heart with us. Man, props to you, man. All the best uh, with all your your work and all your your journals and your writings. I hope it goes uh, continues to go far. I'm looking for the New York bestseller. New York bestseller. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. <laughs> uh, thank man. you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, grateful. Grateful. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Um, just thank you for reaching out, but also just what you do. And like, I'm big on our next generation and them looking at signposts and you're a signpost also um, in terms of what you're doing and um, and what you're putting out there and um, I look forward to what's ahead for you and the more you know um, more spaces that you get to go into and the more opportunities that may come and and you know meeting you is so humble so like I, I gra uh, gravitate towards people um, that uh, are relatable <laughs> and that um that haven't changed up that um i can i know that i can sit with you and have a beer and and have a good laugh and you know and to um thank you for being someone that um as your um as you continue to develop as a as a as a person and and going into different spaces but you're still um relatable to um our people and um yeah thank you I, I i feel so grateful and um just taking a lot of remind good reminders and then some of these little tools that i can really take to um be better for myself and so yeah thank you brother no thank you yeah um, <clears throat> excuse me just a couple more questions and um similar to the boys honestly just really grateful and it's cool to see behind the gratitude, all these other really awesome messages like intentionality, all that sort of stuff. Um, the last couple of questions I had was, what's the toughest thing that you find to be grateful for? <laughs> so the, I, I set myself the challenge the other day. I was, I was picking up the dog shit in the backyard and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I went, okay, I, I got to find something grateful about picking up the dog shit. There's nothing, there's nothing good. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing good about picking up dog shits, but but what happened was that like you know I was, I was doing it and thinking about how much I hate it, but then I started I went oh you know after this I'm going to take the dogs to the beach because I live out by Bethel so I was like I'm going to take the dogs to the beach, then I started getting excited about the beach and thinking about how cool the beach was. So even though I couldn't find gratitude in picking up dog shits, I still found it. You know. Yeah, no, Pretty. that's cool. Um, and the very last one was. What is your top of the mountain? Ooh, that is a tough question, man. Um, oh, man, I, for me, uh, it's doing less, you know, having more time, like, like and I think um, we, we grow up or we're taught, like, you know, to make more money, but 
you know, we should just make more time. And if, if you need more money so that later on in life you have more time, then, then you need to just keep fighting for more time, you know. And so, like, my, my top of the mountain is re retired by 50, you know, so that yeah. I can just have more time to do the things that I love. I love that. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Man, pretty much, much, um, much it. aroha. Man, awesome, brother. Thank you so much. Um, he, uh, every gift that comes on, we always give them a, a cartoon or a caricature of, of of them. And so um, this is on behalf of the Mandate team. Awesome, awesome brother. This is for you, brother. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. I love much. it. I appreciate it. We, we, I would really appreciate it, brother. Um, but is there anyone that you can think of that would be ideal to come on the podcast? Yeah, I thought about this coming here, and, I, and there's only one name that kept coming to mind was Manu Vativé. I want to hear more story about sto more about his story, man. Like I, I listened to a podcast to another podcast, and he was on there for about twenty minutes, and and I felt like I wanted to listen to more, and and find out where he's going, you know, because I, I feel like like those people that have been through so much struggle, when they come out the other side and they've got so much hope, they're like inspirational, man. Awesome, oh, man. man. That's awesome. Cool. That's awesome. Now we'll hit him up. Yeah, Manu. Yeah, awesome, bro. Uh, but I guess um, we always give our guests the last words of encouragement to our, our viewers and the listeners. Yeah, I guess uh, if I had any words of encouragement, it, it would just be to give give it a go. If you want to do something, just have a try and you've got nothing to lose. And, you know, just, just don't be afraid to try things. Awesome, man. Awesome. Thank you. Please, if you are out uh, out and about, uh, what calls any other bookstores out there, please um, uh, buy one, buy one. Support the brother, but also uh, I can guarantee it's going to be beneficial for you in terms of um, Whaka, Whaka Whitae and the, grat uh, the Gratitude um, book. So please um, support the brother, but also um, it's going to be um, more than just um, a book. It's going to be life-changing as well. So please don't forget to like, uh, subscribe and comment. Look forward to your wealth in our comments. And as usual, brothers, refine, unlock, and take, and take charge. charge. Bandit.